effort again. We're busting ours to kick yours. That's big time. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Oh, did he felt that one? Intensity is not a perfume. It was a no doubter. Five, four, three, two, one. We are up in the bird's nest here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Brendan Mortensen alongside a probably tired Matt Bonaparte after a West Coast extra innings game. Bones, how are we feeling this morning? I'm fired up. Yeah. I'm fired up for this pot, yeah. this show. I'm pumped. Pumped. I'm absolutely pumped. Love it. Well, we are coming to you a little early today if you are following along live on Facebook or YouTube because we need to get to Bowie. Going to talk to some Bay Sox today. Guys like Dylan Beavers, Judd Fabian. We were going to talk to Jackson Holiday. He I, gone. Guess what? He's, he's not there anymore. He's out of here. Stretch, stretch, put it on the board. Yes, he's gone. <laughs> he is in AAA Norfolk. We've got to start with that, Bones. We're going we're gonna to get to Jorge Lopez. We're going to get to DL Hall today. But Jackson Holiday is 19 years old. And just hit a double for the Norfolk Tides last night. Yeah, man. I mean, can I just say this? 34 multi-hit games in 108 games this season. That's a bunch. That's insane, dude. Yeah. He had 12 at AA out of the 36 games he played. Yeah. Uh, so he's keeping it at a, at a clean, like, a third of the games he plays. He has a multi-hit game, which is bonkers for a 19 year old kid to be doing yeah uh he's ridiculously good and uh you didn't need me to uh to tell you that to understand it he's so so good and a special talent for what he's doing yeah number one prospect in baseball for a reason he is the number one ranked prospect according to both mlb pipeline and baseball america nobody else in the top 100 is 19 at triple a thought that maybe jackson churio could have gotten there but he's 20 years old Ethan Solace in San Diego is like 12 and he's in double yeah, A. I was about to say, he's like, he'll he's probably like five years be, old. be there. But Jackson Holiday, in case you forgot, started this season with low single A Delmarva. He played 14 games there and hit about 400. So they decided, yeah, you're probably good for high A Aberdeen. There he plays 57 games, hits 314 with an on base percentage over 450 and a 940 OPS. And then he goes to Double A Bowie, and I think that getting to Double A Bowie was very impressive. That was his goal for Jackson Holiday. Yeah, that was his goal at the beginning of the season. When we talked to him, he said that he wanted to get to Double A by the end of the year to put himself in a good position to make the majors in 2024. And we thought at the time that that goal was pretty lofty of getting to Double A Bowie. In just his age 19 season, his first full year of professional baseball, we saw, you know, Colton Kowser get up to that level in his first year of professional baseball, but Colton Kowser was a well-established college hitter. Same goes for Adley Rutschman. And if Jackson Holiday was going to get to double-A buoy this year, he was going to be on a Gunnar Henderson-like trajectory where you were a high high school draft pick and you have just played so well that even though you're way younger than everybody else, you still get up to double A. And then Holiday gets up to double A Bowie and in 36 games hits 338 with a 421 on base percentage, an OPS close to 930, three homers, three triples, nine doubles. Do you think he's impressing himself or is he just like, this is what I do? He has to be. Right. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess he kind of let the cat out of the bag, letting us know what his goals were. But, like, if he hadn't done that, I could have believed that he just is a machine and he absolutely thought this, this was going to happen. Yeah. But, again, it was his goal for the season to get to double-A buoy. And, again, to put it into some more context, Colton Kowser got up to triple-A in his first professional season, which, again, was very impressive. He was one of the first members of his draft class to get up to that point. I think it was Colton Kowser and Sal Freelich had been up to AAA. But again, Colton Kowser was 22, and he was a college draft pick. Yeah. It was still great, but it, that was his first professional season after three years. He was expected years to be more established. Of college baseball, yeah. exactly. Adley Rutschman got up to AAA in 2021 at age 23, 
We'll give Adley Rutschman a little bit of a pass there in terms of the age because we know the minor league season got canceled in 2020. He probably would have been there sooner. But again, at best, Adley Rutschman is getting to AAA at age 22, again, because he was a three-year college hitter at Oregon State. Gunnar Henderson, again, who we said it, it was very impressive for Gunnar to get up to AA, very impressive for him to get up to AAA when he did. Gunnar got up to AAA last season at 21 years old, which was incredible. Jackson Holiday is 19, and he's there. Yeah, I mean, well, he has a real chance to make a major league debut at 20 years old. Yeah. Which is He doesn't bonkers. turn 20 until December. Yeah, so he'll turn 20 in December, uh, and then next year, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. He could be called up. I mean, he, he's going to be a name in circulation of being called up throughout the season. Yeah. He's going to be your Jordan Westberg, your Joey Ortiz, your Colton Kowser of this year uh, of in terms of is he going to make the call. Maybe if he has a, a, a good spring training, he'll be a Grayson Rodriguez kind of candidate to make the opening day roster. But who knows? Um, he is so, so talented. And like you said, those numbers that he's put up at every single level now continue to impress, even though it seems like, all right, he did it there, but he's not going to be able to do it here. And then he just keeps proving you wrong. Yeah, he hit better in double A buoy than he hit in high A Aberdeen. The on base percentage took a little bit of a dip. He was striking out a little bit more, walking a little bit less. But again, that's to be expected when you are at that point still two, three years younger than everybody else. But now in AAA, he's three, four, five years younger than everybody else. And he is facing pitchers who are either, again, on the brink of the majors or have been in the majors for a while and are bouncing back and forth between AAA and the big leagues. Think about some of the pitchers that are on the Norfolk Tides roster right now in terms of guys that Jackson Holiday, you know, could be facing on other teams. But for the Orioles right now, you have John Means, Tyler Wells, Brian Baker, Mike Bauman. Those are all pretty well-established big league Those are pitchers. major leaguers, yeah. Yeah, guys that are either that are on rehab assignment or are just down in AAA getting some innings and might be back up in Baltimore at some point soon. Those are the types of pitchers that Jackson Holiday is now facing. The 19-year-old who was drafted out of high school last year. It's so difficult to put this into perspective. Yeah. Because he's flown from the kid who seemed like he was so far away, but yet so talented, to now being knocking on the door. Uh, I mean, yeah, in terms of the guys that he's going to be teammates with now, you're putting them into the conversation with guys who are well-established and they'll be ball players. Uh, but 20 years old in December... A good chance he makes his debut yet next year. We listed the ages of the other guys. In terms of MLB debuts, Adley, 24. Gunner, 21. Jordan Westberg, 24. Kowser, 23. Grayson Rodriguez, 23. Yeah. The only other guy I can think of, Kevin Gosman, was 21. I don't think anybody did it at 20. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. I, Juan Soto? <laughs> I mean, Jason Dominguez is really the only other guy on the top 100 that you can look at at a similar level right now. Jason yeah. Dominguez is 20 and just made his big league debut for the Yankees. But Jackson Holiday, again, like you mentioned, I think at the beginning of the season, if you were looking way down the line and said, okay, when is Jackson Holiday going to be a big leaguer? I think your loftiest expectations would have been maybe we see him in September of 2024. Agreed. Maybe he's like a fun end of the season call up that could help the Orioles in the playoffs. And like it would be a really young, fun, exciting story. If he was 20 years old, the Orioles were making the playoffs in 2024. He's here to make a push. Maybe he gives you 15, 20 games in the yeah. big leagues. But now you're looking at Jackson Holiday as somebody who could be a pretty early on in the season call-up. I, I think that's still pretty lofty. But he's going to get about 20 games in AAA at the end of this year. And the Norfolk Tides won the first half uh, champion. It, it, AAA is a little bit weird in terms of how the playoffs work. The Norfolk Tides had the best record in the Eastern League for the first half of the season, which means they clinched a spot in the championship series at the end of this month. So Jackson Holiday is going to be with the Tides for their playoff series. So he should get right around 20 games. And... 
if Jackson Holiday gets 20 games at the end of this year, goes through, you know, a, a big league spring training where he is going to get some more reps with big leaguers, he'll probably get in some spring training games, more spring training games. He could be looking at 40, 50 games in AAA to begin next year. I mean, I, I know we were kind of saying the same thing about Colton Kowser this season, and Kowser has spent a longer period of time with the Tides this season than I think a lot of people have anticipated. But Jackson Holiday is a different prospect than Colton Kowser. No, that's no disrespect to Colton Kowser. He's still the number 14 prospect in baseball. But he ain't number one. But we're talking about number one here. Yeah. We're talking about an Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson caliber of prospect. And I would be a little bit surprised if Jackson Holiday, given the production that we've already seen so far, it's entirely possible that he, he struggles a little bit at AAA. Don't really have any evidence to say that he would at this point, but you would understand it if the 19-year-old had a little bit of struggles in AAA. I'd be surprised if, given what we've seen so far, he gets more than 50, 60 games in AAA next season. Well, I was just going to say, I'm curious to see whether some of these arms, and like we said, they're major league arms at this point that he could be facing in AAA, yeah. if somebody f can stump him. Because at some point, or at, at this point, nobody has. He's just running through every single arm that he faces. Uh, and at some point, he, he's just got to be humbled, right? And, and you would think. 19 years old in AAA, that's kind of where you expect it to be. But with a guy like this, I'm not so confident that it's going to happen. We haven't. Again, we have not seen any evidence to suggest that it will. Yeah. And if Jackson Holiday keeps hitting over 300 and is just, you know, continuing to produce the way that he is produced going into next undeniable. season, I mean, if you thought fans were going crazy for Grayson Rodriguez at the beginning of this season or for Gunnar Henderson at the end of last year, the commotion for Jackson Holiday, if he puts up two good months in AAA to start next year, oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, the rebuild I already feel is complete, but I mean, that'll be a cherry on top when he, yeah. when he just shows up uh, and, and his talent is added to this group. He's so good. I mean, there's just yeah. like, there's, it, it's so obvious that it's, it's hard to make complex. He's yeah. so just very good. And in his first AAA game, as a lefty, hit a double off a lefty. Yeah. And he stretched it. It was a single. Yeah, and he stretched it <laughs> because he's also a five-tool player and yeah. is that fast. Not to dunk on the Arizona Diamondbacks and Drew Jones here, but just want to point out there was a, a very lengthy conversation about whether or not Jackson Holiday was the best prospect in this draft class last year. A lot of people thought, it was Drew Jones. I mean, myself included. I came on this show last year and said that I thought that Drew Jones was the most talented prospect in that draft class. I was not correct. Uh, Drew Jones. That's big of you to admit. Uh, Drew Jones has struggled with some injuries and different things like that. Drew Jones is also 19. He is still in single A with a 619 OPS in 25 games. And Jackson Holiday is in triple A. <laughs> I think the Orioles Arms made the up. right call. That's why I am not making these decisions. Jackson <laughs> Holiday, clearly the best prospect in that draft class. I wish the best for Drew Jones. Hope he turns things around. Incredibly talented kid. He's in single A. Jackson Holiday's in triple. Jackson Holiday's knocking on the door. Yeah. Good choice by the Orioles, I think. Very much so. We've got some bullpen arms to talk about, Bones. Uh, first one being... Jorge Lopez, and as is tradition on this show, we have planned what we are going to talk about beforehand, and of course, the two bullpen arms that we'll, we will be talking about today gave up runs yep. in last night's game. I was game. looking at that too. Happened with Jack Flaherty. We did a Jack Flaherty deep dive, and the night before was not a good outing against the Padres, and of course, last night, Jorge Lopez gives up some runs, DL Hall blows a save as I'm going to be talking about him as a potential elite closer but let's start with Jorge Lopez who is back with Baltimore and my first note on this section of the show is just look at the size of this colossal W yeah. because Jorge Lopez is back I don't know that you could win a trade more than the Orioles have they won, won this it one. so unbelievably hard yes. it's, it's insane. ridiculous how much they won this trade yeah Jorge Lopez uh, is not playoff eligible which is a bummer 
but he is going to be helping this team throughout September, and he's also under team control next year. He's arbitration eligible in 2024, so if the Orioles would like to bring Jorge Lopez back next year, Jorge Lopez will be back. Yeah. They can offer him arbitration. I feel like he's one of those guys, too, where um, the place he plays is incredibly important. Yes. Because in last year, as an all-star in Baltimore, he was, you know, unhittable. A 1-6-8 ERA, he was striking guys out left and right as one of the main uh, game-enders on this team. Uh, he gets traded. Cade Povich and Yenyer Cano are brought back. Uh, and then he's he really struggled in both Minnesota and Miami, where he's yeah. played since. Uh, in Minnesota, 4-8-1 ERA, only seven saves. Uh, not as many strikeouts. Strikeout numbers went pretty far down for him. Miami, a 9-2-6 ERA in limited time. Uh, but he's, he's happy to be back in Baltimore. Yeah, very much so. And you mentioned the trade. They get back Cade Povich, who is the Orioles' 11th-ranked prospect, one of their better pitching prospects in the system. They also got back Juan Nunez, who doesn't get talked about very much, but he's in high A Aberdeen as the Orioles' 28th-ranked prospect. So they got two top 30 guys for Jorge Lopez, and they got Yenier Cano. Some guy named Their all-star reliever. Yeah. So you get back two top 30 prospects, an all-star in Yenier Cano, and now Jorge Lopez is back. A year later, and you mentioned the struggles away from Baltimore. At the end of 2022, he's got a 437 ERA with the Twins for the rest of the 2022 season. Had a 509 ERA in Minnesota at the beginning of this year. Gets traded to Miami where he has a 926 ERA. And the Marlins part ways with Jorge Lopez pretty quickly. And you mentioned how happy he is to be back in Baltimore. As much as Jorge Lopez is going to help on the field for the Orioles, and I truly believe that through the rest of September and going into next year, if the Orioles are able to unlock the same things that they did a season ago... Or even ago half of it. With, ...with Lopez, or even half of it, he is going to be a major contributor in this bullpen. But it's just... I'm just so happy for Jorge Lopez. Yeah. He had taken some time away from baseball over the last year or so... He went on an IL stint with mental health issues and was just struggling a lot, both on the field and off the field. And the quotes from Jorge Lopez coming back to Baltimore, just uh, that it makes you emotional about baseball. I mean, Jorge Lopez, such a good guy. There were so many stories about him, you know, making friends with the security guards, just knowing everybody's names in the building was just that kind of person. And to hear him talk about what returning to Baltimore meant to him, obviously there was the baseball aspect of it, where he recognizes that the Orioles coaching staff was able to get the most out of him on the field. And he understands that this is a business and that the Orioles are acquiring him because they want his production on the field to be close to what it was last year, some form of that. But he was just talking about how happy his family was that he was back in Baltimore, how much it meant to them to see him back in a place where he really thrived, both on the field and personally. It's a win for the Orioles on the field because I do think he will contribute, but it's also just a win for Jorge Lopez as a person and for the Orioles organization as a whole. Yeah, obviously something you love to see. Um, and uh, in terms of his production, I can't imagine that uh, it won't help being yeah. back in a place that he's incredibly comfortable uh, and that his family will be happy and, and just less worries for him off the field, bring success on the field. So uh, like you, I'm very happy for Jorge, uh, and I'm happy that the Orioles were able to make it happen. Yeah, and let's talk about kind of our expectations for Lopez at the end of this year. As you mentioned, in 2022, the 168 ERA had a, was striking out 10 guys per nine innings. The whip was under one. I'm not necessarily expecting that through September. Again, it is kind of a bummer that he is not playoff eligible. The Orioles got him just a little too late. You have to be a member of the organization by September 1st to be on the playoff roster. But at a time when you lose your all-star closer in Felix Bautista, it's really nice to get back your all-star closer from the previous season. 
And we know Lopez has the stuff. He has a sinker that can hit 98, 99 miles an hour. He has a pretty similar profile, I would say, to Yenier Cano. Throws maybe a little bit harder. Obviously has not had the same production this season, but he's kind of a similar pitcher to Cano. Yeah, flame-throwing righty, back end of the game. Uh, in terms of what role he'll be playing here, I'm not sure that... I mean, with Felix Hurt, I don't know that it's out of the question that he shows up often late in games, but yeah. I can also see him just as another option for Brandon Hyde because I'm not sure, uh, and I'm not sure that Brandon Hyde knows exactly what Jorge Lopez is yet. We've only seen him uh, in very limited time. So... Um, he could be a huge contributor in terms of this playoff push, even though the Orioles are in a pretty good spot. Uh, but with his numbers where they were this season at the end of last season as well, I think I'd be a little hesitant to put him in such high leverage situations rather than situations in which there's a lead light. Sure. I, I think he fits right into the fold with kind of the sixth, seventh, eighth inning guys. It seems like the Orioles have a lot of those pitchers at this point, which isn't a bad thing. I don't think he is going to take the closer spot. I don't think he is going to take Agreed. the role that he had a season ago. I think that's pretty firmly Yenier Cano's spot to lose at this point. But when you're looking at some possibilities for the 6th, 7th, 8th innings, I think you're looking at Danny Coulomb and Cianel Perez as your left-handed options. I think D.L. Hall works into that conversation as well. We'll talk about D.L. Hall in a minute. Those are three really solid left-handed options for the 6th, 7th, 8th innings. And then for right-handed guys, I think you're looking at probably Jorge Lopez and Fuji. Fuji with a great outing last night. It's able to close the door on the Angels and secure that victory in extra innings. I think Fuji is, I would say, pretty firmly in that 6th, 7th, 8th inning discussion as a high-leverage guy. And I think Lopez is in there as well. Yeah, actually, I was going to say that Lopez and Fuji are honestly on a similar uh, platform in my mind in terms of my confidence levels when they run into the ball game. Sure. Um, like you said, Fuji did have a really good performance last night, and, and we've seen him be good this season. We've seen him uh, struggle with his command a little bit and let up a, a couple runs here and there as well, uh, but we know that the potential for him to be effective is there. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, it's the same thing with Lopez. We know that he's got it in the tank. We don't necessarily see it all the time. But in terms of my confidence level, those two guys are incredibly similar in my mind. Yeah, and I think both of those pitchers have a lot of room to grow in yeah. terms of what their stuff can do with this Orioles coaching staff. When you look back to Jorge Lopez in 2022, his three best pitches were the sinker, the curveball, and the changeup, according to StatCast. The curveball had a run value of six. The sinker had a run value of three. The changeup had a run value of two. When you look at this season, the changeup has still been good for Jorge Lopez, but the sinker has a run value of negative two, and the curveball has a run value of negative one. And Jorge Lopez didn't just forget how to pitch. Maybe there's some mechanical things that need to be adjusted, but the velocity has gone down maybe a little bit on the heater, but not by much. And you know the curveball is there. So really for Lopez this year, I think it's just a matter of getting back to whatever the Orioles coaching staff was able to do with him a season ago. Remember, in going into 2022, after the 2021 season, Lopez has been used as a starter. And then at the end of 2021, they went, okay, bullpen time. And I think he got about seven or eight games in the bullpen at the end of 2021, comes into 2022, and it seemed like everybody kind of knew the stuff was there. Paul Mancano and I on this show going into 2022 said, yeah, we think Jorge Lopez is going to lead this team in saves in 2022 because he has the stuff. So the Orioles were able to unlock something in Lopez during the 2022 season to make him a lot more effective as a bullpen arm than he was as a starter. So I'm pretty confident they can do it again. Yeah. I, I don't know why they wouldn't be able to. Absolutely. Uh, and you mentioned that sinker. I think that is the key to a lot of his success. Uh, his ground ball rate 
shrunk a little bit since that incredibly successful season. Uh, and when he has that thing working, it's when that's when he can be incredibly dominant. Yeah. Uh, so if the Orioles can get him back to a position in which all of his pitches are working uh, in capacities in which he likes them, I think he'll be just fine. Like you said, he didn't just forget how to go out there and dominate hitters because he did it for the entirety of the first half last year. So yep. uh, I feel confident that this training staff and this coaching staff is going to be able to put him back into a position in where they're confident putting him in, in high leverage situations and, and games in which they need a reliable arm out of the pen. We've seen the Orioles to you know, get pitchers that have one or two just dominant pitches and be able to find a lot of success in that we know kind of the trend in baseball is to use the sinker as you mentioned not to completely oversimplify things here with Jorge Lopez but looking at his pitch mix from a season ago to this season it's an oversimpl oversimplification but like just throw the pitches that are good I mean in 2022 he was throwing 51 percent sinkers this season, that number is down to 33.5%. Well, you don't know what pitching staffs are telling him to do. You right. Know? And that, like maybe they told him in Minnesota, hey, we want you to throw this more and the sinker less or whatever. And hopefully Baltimore said, hey, throw that right out. Yeah, all right? He's throwing, just do you, man. He's throwing his four-seamer 17% of the time this year. And according to StatCast, it has a run value of negative 12. Last year, Jorge Lopez threw his four-seamer 4.5% four of the time. Why are you throwing the four-seamer so much? I think, again, not to oversimplify it, but I think the Orioles and their pitching coaches have been able to go, okay, let's just simplify stuff. Throw the pitches that are good. We will get the most out of those pitches and use those effectively. I'm very confident that this coaching staff will be able to work with Lopez. In that totally way. agree. I absolutely agree with you. Let's talk about another important bullpen arm here down the stretch, and that's D.L. Hall. D.L. Hall, again, it's unfortunate timing, blew the save last night against the Angels. The Orioles still get the win. No harm, no foul. But D.L. Hall looks close to back. I'm not going to say he is all the way back. He's not pumping 100 like we have seen from D.L. Hall over the last few years here, but the fastball is getting closer to back. He's hitting... 95 pretty consistently, 96, 97 when he needs to. That was not the case at the beginning of the season. When he was tossing his fastball 92, 93, 94 miles an hour, that is not the DL Hall that is going to be effective down the stretch. The DL Hall that is going to be effective down the stretch is the DL Hall that gets exceptional extension and is able to throw that fastball really hard and use his off-speed pitches, which have a ton of movement, more effectively because hitters are so afraid of the fastball. Yeah, I mean, the, the talk with him all year has been about that velocity on his fastball, but what a journey he's been on this season. Back yeah. in June, on June 14th, gives up three earned against Worcester, says, you know what? Can it? I'm going to the complex league. Uh, he goes, he rehabs himself, basically takes himself out of contention for an MLB spot, goes back to rehab everything, try and get his fastball back. Does a ton of hard work to get back to a position in which he's eligible for a role in Baltimore, and he gets it, and he's back, and his fastball is a lot better than it was, but like you said, I wouldn't say it's 100% back. He's not touching 97, 98 as often as he was, but at the same time, he's not resting down around 92, 93 where he was back in June. Uh, yes, he gave up that run last night, but I like a lot of what I've seen from D.L. Hall recently out of the bullpen. It's nice to know that that floor is there because yeah. all along this was the floor for DL Hall. It was he's going to be a back end bullpen guy if he cannot succeed in the majors as a starter. Uh, but it's nice to know that he's succeeded at least a little bit. That he's confirmed that yeah, I can dominate as a back end reliever. Yeah, and we've this has always been the conversation around DL Hall. Like you said, we always knew that if he didn't end up as a successful starter, he could be an elite bullpen arm not a good bullpen arm he could be an elite bullpen arm and we are already seeing it with pretty limited experience here in the bullpen and the fastball still probably not being 100 percent of what it could be 
In terms of the starting pitching conversation, I don't think the Orioles are going to be completely done with D.L. Hall as a potential starter. The offseason is going to be very interesting Yeah, in terms of what the Orioles plan for D.L. Hall. I don't know what the plan is going to be. Coming into this year, we knew that the Orioles were going to try out D.L. Hall as a starter. Obviously, things did not go to plan in AAA Norfolk. You mentioned the long time he had to spend rehabbing, getting the fastball back up to shape. We will see what D.L. Hall ends up doing in the offseason in terms of whether or not he's preparing to be a starter or a lever. I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I support him either way. <laughs> that's, you do you, D.L. That's very nice of you. I also support D.L. Hall. I support, I don't want to be the only one not supporting <laughs> D.L. Hall on the show. It makes me sound weird. But no, he's... He has been excellent since coming back in late August. Since his return, he has appeared in six games with a 2.84 ERA. Opponents hitting just 2.17 with an on-base percentage slightly over 300. The strikeout numbers, I think, will probably continue to go up a little bit. He only has six strikeouts in six and a third innings. Not the same kind of overwhelming stuff that we have seen from D.L. Hall, but he's throwing a lot more strikes he only has three walks in six and a third right now. Not awesome. A lot better than it was. Yeah, a lot better than it was. And I think this situation is in one that a lot of Orioles fans thought D.L. Hall would be in. I think a lot of people, when he did take himself out of contention back in June, thought, all right, this could be it for D.L. We don't know. We haven't seen him be successful for so long. Pitchers all the time fizzle out. Uh, and... I think a lot of people thought that might be the case with DL. It's so nice to see him back at least closer to where he was and where we know that he can be. Um, again, the fastball not exactly where he wants it to be or where anybody else wants it to be. They want it to be a little bit higher, but with a lot more work and, and hard work that he's been putting in, I think he can get there. Yeah, not enough innings to be eligible for the percentile rankings on StatCast, but if you still look at them, if he were to be eligible, the expected ERA, expected batting average, average exit velocity, whiff percentage, strikeout percentage, hard hit percentage, ground ball rate, all at a very high percentile right now. That Obviously, translates to good. Good. <laughs> does not have enough innings under his belt to be eligible in those categories, but with some more innings, if he were to be eligible, those would be very good percentile rankings. I genuinely believe that D.L. Hall can be an elite closer at some point in his career if he sticks in the bullpen. Yeah. I mean, failed starters, they're elite bullpen arms a lot of the time. Yeah. I mean, look at Andrew Miller. He was a guy who was a starter. Zach ended Britton. up being... Yeah, Mariano Rivera. Plenty of guys. Yeah. So uh, keep your head up, DL. Yeah. In terms of what he will be the rest of this season, again, I think it's a similar conversation to Jorge Lopez where... D.L. Hall, I believe, has the potential to be a very good closer, but until Yenier Cano loses that job, it is still Yenier Cano's job. And I am not expecting Yenier Cano to lose yeah, that I job at any point this thing. season. So D.L. Hall, Jorge Lopez, both very good options at the back end of the bullpen, but it's still Yenier Cano's closer job at this point, I think. I agree. So the bullpen as a whole... Obviously, you have lost Felix Bautista. But over the last few weeks, you have added Jorge Lopez, who was a waiver claim. You have added D.L. Hall, who was called up from AAA Norfolk. A few weeks ago, you had Jacob Webb, who has 13 innings under his belt as an Oriole. And now, all of a sudden, even without Felix Bautista, I think you are still looking at a pretty elite bullpen at this point. A bullpen that right now still doesn't include guys like Mike Bauman and Brian Baker and Nick Vespi, who have spent a good amount of time in the big leagues, Bauman and Baker especially, and were still solid bullpen arms. Mike Bauman with a 382 ERA on the season, Brian Baker with a 364, Nick Vespi with a 430, but again has dominated AAA Norfolk in his career. Even without those guys in the bullpen at this point, you have Yenier Cano with a 165, Danny Coulomb with a 245, Sino Perez, who has been improving, Shintaro Fujinami, who has shown a lot of potential and is improving, DL Hall, who has huge upside, Jacob Webb, who has, again, still an ERA just over two with the Orioles. 
somehow, without Felix Bautista, it still seems like you could give the ball to just about anybody in this bullpen right now, and I feel pretty confident with them yeah. taking the ball. I was just about to say, I feel pretty good about most guys coming out of that bullpen. Yeah. Um, and they don't have all the flashiest names in baseball in terms of bullpen arms, but like you said, they've picked up guys this season who are getting the job done. Jacob Webb is kind of paramount in that discussion. Comes yeah. out of nowhere, and he's really been effective. Fujinami as well has been a lot better than he was in Oakland with Baltimore. Um, there's a lot of talent in this bullpen and a lot of guys that I'd be comfortable giving the ball to. Uh, and when it translates to playoff time, that's something that's going to be incredibly valuable, uh, as we all know bullpens are when it comes to fall baseball. Yeah, and just look at last night's game. I'm going to read to you the guys that appeared in last night's victory over the Angels in extra innings. You don't get a lot of length out of Dean Kramer, who goes just four and two-thirds. Stop me if you find a bullpen arm that you don't really have confidence in at this point. CNL Perez enters the game, and then Jorge Lopez, followed by Danny Coulomb and Jacob Webb, followed by DL Hall, Joey Crable, who is a newer addition I didn't mention, but has a 225 ERA in the bigs right now, Joey Crable, and Shintaro Fujinami. That's a bunch of talent. Yeah. Uh, I think there's question talent. marks here and there. Sure. But. Nobody who Brandon Hyde gave the ball to last night comes into the game and I'm going, this isn't going to be good. Yeah, Lopez and Crable are the two guys I'd like to see a bigger sample size. Sure. Uh, and like to see them do it for a little bit longer. But otherwise, it's a bunch of guys I'm relatively confident in. Yeah, and I think when you look around the league, if you are probably if you are a fan of a different team, you can probably think of a bullpen arm on your team that gets handed the ball and you go, Ugh, here we go. The Orioles don't really have that. I agree. It's a nice luxury. Yeah, it absolutely is. Because a lot of the times when that guy comes in, it means the game's over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we haven't seen that at all this year, really. Which it can be valuable, I suppose, at some points if the game is just Inning over seasons, yeah. and you just need somebody to come in. But the Orioles are not going to be out of a lot of games this season. We know how talented the lineup is. The starting pitchers, we haven't seen you know too many blow-up starts this season where you're just completely out of a game. And even if there are blow-up starts, the Orioles lineup is usually good enough to get them back into the game. There isn't really anybody on this Orioles team right now that I would look at and say, yeah, he's only coming in the game when the Orioles are down five or they're up seven and you just need somebody to eat a bunch of innings. Because even somebody like Joey Crable, who was a surprise addition for many... When rosters expanded on September 1st, he's got a 225 ERA this season. Yeah, he's played incredibly well. He's been mostly in AAA Norfolk, but Joey Grable, still a contributor. Still a solid piece of this bullpen at this point. Yeah, and another guy who um, we haven't seen a bunch, but at the same time, we knew that he had yeah, the he's talent got to be an MLB player. Right. He's got four innings under his belt. Joey Grable has been solid for the Orioles in the past. And with Jorge Lopez and D.L. Hall, two additions to this bullpen, the Orioles have somehow, without their all-star closer, the best closer in baseball, best reliever in baseball, in Felix Bautista, have still been able to make an elite bullpen. Guy had a conversation for best pitcher in baseball. Yeah. And they've still done it. And Michael Elias just collecting W's left and right <laughs> from claiming Jorge Lopez on waivers, who will probably come back to Baltimore and just toss another two ERA because that's what the Orioles seem to do at this point. It's it's uncanny. They will claim relievers that you thought were bad and make them all-stars, and then we will laugh. Because that's what Michael Elias does. And it's a good time. It's a great time. The Orioles are having a good time, too. They're winners of four straight, but that'll just about do it. Here for this edition of the Bird's Nest. Thanks so much for tuning along. If you have been following along with us live, thanks for following along. Thanks. If you didn't, you should be next time. We're live every Wednesday, usually at 11 o'clock. Sometimes there's exceptions like today. On Facebook and YouTube, we'll be live. Or you can catch us after the fact on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google something. I don't know. Wherever you find podcasts or digital shows, you can find the bird's nest. Big thanks to Amy Jennings behind the scenes. For Matt Bonaparte, I'm Brendan Mortensen. We'll catch you next time.